You know, Netflix, for example, the chairman of Netflix, he said he was going to rage war on sleep. Really? This is the chairman. And you just think, in our society, if that's what parents and, you know, adults are trying to work against marketing, if we look at Barbie, if we look at the amount of money that was spent on Barbie, oh gosh, right? marketing, <laughs> it's so powerful. Right. Welcome to another episode of Find Your Calm. Today, we're talking about all things sleep-related, but probably not the way that you're thinking. We have an amazing expert here with us today, Julie Mallon, who is the founder of Nurture to Sleep, with over 30 years of experience in health. You are a registered nurse. Yes, you have worked with and specialized not only with children, but with parents as well, which is the whole entire ecosystem when it comes to sleep. And um, I'm very excited about this conversation today because sleep, as we know it, has drastically changed. We live in a very, very modern, fast-paced world. And um, believe it or not, our sleep has directly impacted our health, our mental well-being, our spiritual well-being, all aspects. And Julie is taking up the mantle to to really make sure that we understand how relevant this topic is. So Julie, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about all this. You're most welcome and it's my pleasure. And I do think, um, just diving straight in, yeah. I do think that we as health practitioners really have a duty of care to get that information out there and we want it's there for everyone it's not my information that I'm learning it's not my knowledge I really want to share my knowledge absolutely absolutely so like you said let's just dive right in what brought you into the world of focusing on sleep there's so many different areas of health to focus on so why did you choose sleep Again, it's really interesting. So my background, as you said, was medical. So I started off as a nurse. Now, back, you know, in the last century, unless you had qualified as a nurse, you couldn't qualify as a midwife. Now, I had always wanted to um, be a midwife because for me, midwifery is about the start of a new life. And interestingly, it's about health. Mm -hmm. It's not about sickness. So I did my nursing and then I became a midwife. I then worked as a midwife and there was one particular night where I delivered eight babies by myself. This is back in the UK. Now, for me, it was a really dangerous situation in that I wasn't practicing any of my skills as a midwife. I was merely catching. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I didn't think it was fair to the mothers who were having the babies or the children. Mm -hmm. But equally, when I then came home to my three daughters... My cup was completely empty. Mm -hmm. And so this wasn't the mother who I had ever chosen to be. Right. So I still wanted to use all my experience and my knowledge. So I went back to university and I qualified as a health visitor. Now, the four main components of a health visitor are child psychology, child development, sleep and nutrition. Mm -hmm. But within that encompassing of how to support parents, that was such an important part of my practice. So I qualified and practiced for many years mm -hmm. supporting families. And then when I moved to the Middle East, so many parents were asking me about sleep for their children and were really, really struggling. And I am, um, my nature is if I don't understand something, I have to find a route, I have to study to make sense of it. Yes. Yep. And so I was learning more and more about sleep. And I just saw that there is this huge gap of knowledge, of information, and and how can we change this? Right. So that's what's brought me into this sleep journey. Yes, yes. And so we know that sleep naturally, especially in this modern world, you're a working adult, you you know, you go out probably from college on, you your sleep just really sucks all the way around. <laughs> and to, to yeah. put it to put put it in better terms. So um, but you've you've done a lot of work with children. And, and you and I have spoken about this, uh, you know, quite a bit as well, is that um, when you think about sleep, you don't really think that kids have an issue with sleep. You're like, they, they fall asleep anywhere. They'll take a nap. They go, to, you know, they'll go to bed. You have yeah. when they're in that toddler stage, you know, they may have the no nap thing, but eventually they conk out. So what made you choose to really hone in on children? So 
I mean, there's a number of reasons. Primarily, there was a real need there within the community where I was in Kuwait, Mm -hmm. first of all, before we moved here. But parents were really, really struggling. You saw of the incredible negative impact it was having on the family unit, Mm -hmm. the stress that, you know, if children weren't sleeping, parents weren't sleeping. And then it was just this vicious cycle. So there is that. But also, if we look at sleep overall, we know that one third of the world is not sleeping. Right. So that also spoke to me that sleep isn't what we think it is. It's not that easy. Exactly. It's not that easy. So what do you think changed, though? Why is it that before perhaps we were sleeping better, what what were the dynamics or the, the things that caused sleep to change? You know... As you said in your intro, in that we are living in this very fast-paced modern world mm-hmm. and things are changing for parents and and for adults as a whole. Mm-hmm. You know, I was at an appointment on Sunday evening and I looked out of this building and the whole of Dubai was lit up. We are so starved of the darkness. Mm. And we know that the sleep hormone, for example, the sleep hormone requires darkness to be produced optimally. We know that if there is any light coming into the environment where we are sleeping, Mm -hmm. the sleep production is compromised. So there is that. And then, of course, there is the... um, the, any kind of screen technology. We know that technology is, is being built. You know, Netflix, for example, the chairman of Netflix, he said he was going to rage war on sleep. Really? This is the chairman. And you just think, in our society, if that's what parents and, you know, adults are trying to work against, marketing, if we look at Barbie, if we look at the amount of money that was spent on Barbie, marketing, (laughs) it's so powerful. Right. So there is so many, like you say, so many distractions that are having an impact, even food. Yes. You know, food has a huge impact on our sleep, nutrition. Absolutely. Now we talk about nutrition and we talk about the three pillars of health and you can go on to say the six pillars of health Mm -hmm. if you're bringing in mindfulness and wellness. Yes. Let's dive into that. (laughs) Yeah. If we we talk about the three pillars of health Mm -hmm. and we talk about those being sleep, nutrition and exercise. Mm -hmm. But actually, if we don't sleep well, then the body's metabolic ability to process and absorb food is compromised without good sleep. If we don't sleep well, we know that we are at greater risk Mm -hmm. of having an injury. So again, without sleep, we can't exercise as efficiently as we... So therefore, the only thing that is more important than sleep is breathing. That is fascinating. That's it. I I mean, when you think about like the hustle culture, we live in such a hustle hustle culture, given where the economy is today, inflation, um, you know, so many people, we don't live in a world where you can work a normal job and get a pension anymore. So you're always on the go and you're anticipating your financial situation and that keeps you up at night, right? That's just one of the many things that keeps you up at night. So um, there's this, there is a saying that co- that accompanies hustle culture is like, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I'm, I'm working all the time, but not realizing how damaging this is to the very existence being present, yeah. um, while you're trying to achieve this, this life. Yeah. Now, thankfully, you know, that saying we'll sleep when we're dead. Thankfully, there is so much research now that is showing us that that is completely incorrect (laughs) whether it be child or adult right so if we're looking at children you know there's two studies there's a really great study um from brisbane university Mm. and they looked at over three thousand children and the they followed the children from birth through, through to the age of six and seven years and what they found was that the children who were not sleeping independently by the age of five those were the children who were much more prone to emotional outbursts both in the classroom and the playground and those were the children who were also poor self-regulators. Now, if we're looking at, if we unpick both of those things, so what does it mean to be, you know, a good self-regulator? Right. We know that is one of the pivotal aspects of success in all fields. Correct. Because when we can self-regulate, we problem solve. And that really puts us in a much stronger position mm-hmm. to deal with all the stresses and strains of life. So if we can help our children have those tools and have those skills, yeah. they will bring them into adulthood because we are growing in an adult, we're not growing a child. Exactly. 
I think that that is a, a, an, an incredible distinction, right? Mm-hmm. Because you talk about um, being able to suffer, self-regulate at five and I have known many mothers <laughs> that enjoy that co-sleep time and wanting yeah. to keep the baby a baby, yeah. um, but didn't, you don't realize that that particular action is harming other areas of life, and you're you're keeping this child a child, but not realizing you're not you're raising them for the world. You're not raising yeah. them for yourself. But I I do believe that language is so powerful, and I think the stresses on parents now today. So I think rather than saying harming, I think we're not supporting the growth of our children Mm, because, you know, no matter what you do, it's not right and it's it's wrong. No matter what we do as parents, there's always somebody saying to do it this way and that way. Mm -hmm. But it is about helping our children recognize and really fostering within our children that growth mindset of I can do it. Right. Now, when we're looking at I can do it, we have to recognize that sleep in its purest form is a learnt behaviour. So for all of us, child or adult, our sleep at night, the quality of our sleep at night is determined from the very second that we wake up in the morning. So whatever happens throughout the day, what we're eating, what behaviours we are experiencing, because everything is experiential learning. Absolutely. Whatever we experience, that is going to have an impact, helpful or unhelpful, on our sleep. So if we look at toddlers, for instance, Mm -hmm. and they're going through this stage of development and they are pushing limits and pushing boundaries because that's, and they should be. Yes. They are (laughs) finding themselves where their place is in the world. Right. And they are, you know, beginning to learn what is acceptable behavior and what is not. Mm -hmm. So if their day is about pushing a limit and pushing a behavior and it works, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that worked. Then we're going to do it So I'll try that. Yeah. And then they've tried it throughout the day and come to bedtime of course there's another behavior here to be pushed yes now parents are tired at this point you've given everything you just want them to (laughs) sleep i have given you all of me and now i'm exhausted and i've got work to do and i've got this to do and you've got if you don't get and then unfortunately our downstairs brain our amygdala takes over yeah we are hi- that amygdala hijacks our brain yes and if we can just be more front loading mm-hmm. where our prefrontal cortex is actually in charge yeah then we as parents and adults are going to be able to make those decisions so much easier i i very adamantly recall um my second daughter definitely taught us how to be parents. My first was easy. She slept, she followed the rules, she did all the things. It was simple. My second daughter, she was the one who did exactly as you, she pushed the limit. She yeah. was doing all of the things and really um, we had to figure things out. We had to parent her differently. So um, I, I imagine, I would love to hear like, you know, any stories that you could share of situations of, of, of children who were maybe a little difficult, but you were able to help the parents find this new way of being for the child to sleep better so they too could sleep better? Um, There are so many. (laughs) I mean, so many. But I think what is really important for us to recognize as parents and practitioners is that try and and step back from the behavior Mm -hmm. and see what's going on with the mind, if you like. Interesting. Because... You know, we want to ask why. It might be, you know, that the child is scared. Now, you can do everything with that bedroom to provide this beautiful bedroom for the child, you know, with the latest gadgets, if you like, the the, the fluffiest pillow, the, um, the best bed. But actually, all of that doesn't mean anything mm-hmm. if we're not getting to the root of the problem. So if we're looking at um, how my practice really helps to empower a parent we have to look at it from a perspective of collaboration and cooperation Mm -hmm. you know there's a wonderful quote by benjamin franklin and he says tell me and i remember Mm -hmm. teach me and i i'm sorry tell me and i remember tell me and i remember but i forget teach me and yes i do remember but involve me and i learn Mm -hmm. so we can involve our children from from birth it's not that we can't involve them until they're one, two, three, five, ten. Mm-hmm. The more practice we get into involving our children, a perfect example about involving would be, say you have a, 
a six week old baby. Okay. And we want to change their nappy. We can still do that in a really respectful way. Right. So we're setting up our parenting, long term parenting about being respectful and not about being controlling. And instead of taking their two little legs, pulling them up and wiping the bottom, and then if we roll them from side to side, mm -hmm. that is a much more respectful way of changing. If you think of how many times we change their diaper. Right, right, it's a lot. But it's, if you thought you had to lay on your back, mm -hmm. that's what you feel in a very vulnerable position. Our babies do too. Oh, right. And also, you know, from birth, they have the, re the startle reflex yes so that is exacerbated by them being put on their back so if we roll them from side to side we're not exacerbating and yet we're still being we're still meeting a need of their children of our children right that's from the very beginning and then it it, it has to be about collaboration and cooperation mm -hmm. because if we as parents are holding all the power in any relationship right if there's an imbalance of power then that's not a healthy relationship. And that goes into the mental as you go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely. does. So absolutely. in terms of, um, you know, situations where they've been really, really difficult, very often it's where we're not recognizing where our children are developmentally. So another example would be there is a wonderful psychologist called Erickson. Mm -hmm. And there's many more psychologists has come after him and supported his findings. Mm -hmm. So we know Erickson talks about the eight stages in life that we go through from the cradle through to the grave. Mm -hmm. And that first year is all about trust versus mistrust with our children. And what these longitudinal studies are showing us that if we are able to build this secure attachment within our children mm -hmm. of trust versus mistrust, we know that they will grow into adults who are far less likely to have medical um, mental health issues mm -hmm. now again that is such a frightening yeah. realization the responsibility to you as a parent it's massive but actually we just need to break it down yeah and it's about being flexible and responsive parenting that's what is going to build that secure attachment within that first year yeah. of our children and that's what you help parents do to yeah. break it break those things down it feels like yeah. such a big concepts but you help them to comprehend yeah and then the second year is where the second year, the parenting need for a child is very different because the second year is all about autonomy versus shame. Mm -hmm. So it's our children now going into the second year, they really need to feel that they are an autonomous being. Mm -hmm. And again, that can, that can be so simple in meeting the needs of our children, such as giving them choices where it doesn't matter to you or I. Right. So... Do they want the red pajamas or the blue pajamas? Mm -hmm. Do they want the uh, strawberry yogurt or the peach yogurt? Right. Do they want the blue toothbrush or the red toothbrush? You know, if they want to wear a yellow shoe and an orange shoe, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But then you can apply those limits and boundaries where it does matter, such as they have to sit in the high chair for their meal, for example. Mm -hmm. They non-negotiable right depending on the age of course right. they have to go in their car seat non-negotiable right and sleeping in their cot for example non-negotiable right so if we can bring autonomy to our children so they feel that they have some autonomy in their day mm -hmm. they're going to be much more accepting so it's about knowing where our children are developmentally I, I mean i think that the concept is so beautiful and it's such knowledge that you know thinking back to my childhood I certainly didn't have. My mother didn't no. have. So I'm, you know, while you're working with parents today and providing them this roadmap to how to how to provide the sense of independence for their children as they grow, so that the parents as well can kind of regain their sense of independence as well. Um, you're also dealing with a whole sector of adults who didn't have this knowledge, right? Yes. They're adults yeah. now. They didn't yeah. have this. So they're unlearning so many things. So do you often find um, within your practice that you're coming across adults who don't have this knowledge, they don't know how to sleep, they're just on autopilot and going? And if so, how do you how do you deal with them? What's, what's some of your process of dealing with them? So it, it is quite interesting in that there is so much information out there and parents have read the information but they haven't actually processed it. So it's almost like um, they know 
the why, but they just don't know how, the how. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? Right. But equally, culturally here, you know, being here in Dubai, there is such a huge melting pot. And, you know, it's like um, I have many families whose children are bilingual, trilingual, possibly five or six languages. And mm -hmm. they're, so they're coming from very different cultures, from very different upbringings. Mm -hmm. And very definitely, it is about bridging that gap. Absolutely. Um, but it's also helping our parents understand that actually what we're really working towards is enabling the child to be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if I look at my own three daughters, they are very, very different personalities, same gender, but very different personalities. And so their need for me as a parent was very, very different. Yes. And so I had to equip myself and my husband with what, with what was going to serve my children to be the person that they wanted to be. Exactly. And again, when our parents that I'm working with can see that I am not about power, I am not about something that is very prescriptive because there is no one size fits all. We all learn at different rates. Yes. We also have different learning um, styles. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's looking at how we can help our children understand that it is about learning and it's not about power. Right. Absolutely. I agree. So let's let's shift now because we've talked so much about um, the evidence-based research and just um, looking at the dynamic of how that impacts children for the future. But now let's talk about the energetic aspect of it all, right? Because in, in finding your calm, we definitely believe in evidence-based research, but also in what science has yet to comprehend or be able to quantify. Yeah. And we understand that there is a dynamic that is beyond us. There is this energetic part of us. So when we're talking about the aspect of sleep and not doing it properly, how does that impact your your field, your energetic field and your, your mental well-being in that space? So for example, sleep and anxiety are so interlinked. Mm -hmm. And often if we have a child or an adult who is very anxious, it's they often have poor sleep. Equally, if we have, you know, an older child um, or an adult, their, their sleep is impacted by their anxiety. So we know that anxiety, we know historically anxiety plays a huge part. And both from a physiological perspective and a practical perspective too. So... You know, you talked at the very beginning of this podcast about how we live in this fast-paced world. What we really want to be identifying is how this world is impacting our nervous system. Mm -hmm. So within our nervous system, we have the parasympathetic yes. nervous system. Break, break that down just a bit for people who don't understand what parasympathetic okay, nervous so, system is. So we have two elements to our nervous system. We have the parasympathetic, mm -hmm. which is we often call resting and digesting. Mm -hmm. And then we have, interestingly, the sympathetic, which I don't know who named these because there is nothing <laughs> sympathetic <laughs> about the sympathetic <laughs> nervous system because the sympathetic is fight, fright and flight. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for us to be able to be restful and to be at peace in order to sleep... We need to be spending at, l at least 80% of our day in our parasympathetic state. And, and that is definitely not happening. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's not. definitely not happening. And when we are not spending 80% approximately in our parasympathetic state, then clearly the balance is upside down and we are, our brain, our central nervous system is on. Mm -hmm. And it is, we are, you know, wired and tired. And that's what makes falling asleep so difficult because our brain is just racing. And invariably, it's when we are coming to fall asleep, does our, we really pay attention to this racing mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some things... Because when you're when you're lacking sleep, you want to find an immediate solution. Like you said, some people are reading the things and maybe they put their phone away. Maybe they buy a more expensive pillow, but it's just not working. What are maybe some top three things that someone can do to kind of like just get a good night's sleep? What, what would you recommend? 
The first thing is to make sleep a priority because we are not prioritizing sleep. Mm -hmm. And then once we recognize that we are letting everything else take preference, then we can start to break it down and recognize um, how we can begin to make sleep a priority. But we've also got to be realistic as well. You know, we know that it would take that it takes approximately three months for really to bring those good sleep health, good sleep hygiene um, tools back into place. Mm. You know, for example, we know that caffeine, we know that coffee is not helping with sleep. Right. But one of the worst ways to deal with our caffeine or coffee intake is to go cold is to go cold turkey for a lot of people that is not going to work so we're almost setting ourselves up to fail Mm -hmm. so we need to look at what ask these questions why is coffee so important to us us as an individual right and it might be that we really love that bitter taste we love the ritual of sitting down with that coffee in the morning Mm -hmm. we love and seeing what we can replace it realistically replace it with absolutely and there definitely is something out there that has the antioxidant properties of the coffee right. but without having the impact of the caffeine in causing our sleep to be impacted negatively so it's about breaking down what you think are the roadblocks to you falling asleep so in terms of three things the first thing is having a plan right otherwise it's a dream and it's not going to happen no you action. have to have a plan <laughs> yeah absolutely but we know often with um you know in the morning we wake up and we want we want to have that coffee and we feel this need we need we feel this need to have that coffee yeah we do know all the science is telling us that the best time to have our coffee if we're going to have it is one hour an hour and a half after we have woken and that's, so that's typically most people are getting up yeah. brushing their teeth throwing their clothes on coffee out the door so yeah. that's like first 30 minutes yeah. on average and it's not helping at all because there's a certain neurotransmitter called uh, adenosine which really impacts our sleep. And adenosine is a neurotransmitter and the caffeine in the coffee blocks the adenosine. Now, when we wake up in the morning, the adenosine is negligible. So we're actually wasting an opportunity to Mm -hmm. impact the adenosine in a positive way. Right. So let's just wait for an hour and a half. But very often, one of the reasons why we want this drink is because we are dehydrated from the night sleep. We know that sleep re- dehydrates us. It's a dehydrating activity. Mm-hmm. So the first thing that will be really helpful in the morning, three things, somewhere between six and 800, if we can consume six to 800 mils of water first thing in the morning, mm-hmm. then we are replenishing the fluid that's been lost overnight. Right. That will be the first thing. The second thing, and these three things are not in any particular order, they're all of equal importance. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is exposure to natural sunlight. Because, yeah, (laughs) vitamin D, but it's also regulating our circadian rhythm. And our circadian rhythm is what is going to really reset and regulate our entire 24 hour clock. Now, within the eye, we have a group of cells that sit in the top of our eye. Mm-hmm. Now, when these, because it's sitting in the top of our eye, the lights in this room, for example, because they're overhead, they are the worst for impacting our circadian rhythm. That's why in the evening, for example, low lamps is what's going to support the flow of melatonin. So rehydration, fluid in the morning, six to 800 mils, natural sunlight as much as we can, to reset our internal biological clock that it is morning not evening Mm -hmm. and then the third thing is actually if we can do some kind of stretches because when you spend even if it's just five minutes of stretching Mm -hmm. what that's doing is sending signals to the brain for your night's sleep to release the human growth hormone which is all about restore and repair so we're setting ourselves up for a good night's sleep right from the morning that's wonderful. That's just wonderful. three things. Just those simple three things. And I imagine that given given the reality that the focus for so many people is get up, I've got to go to work, I've got to make the things happen, I've got to come back, pay the bills, do the, you know, make the dinner, deal with the kids. Even those simple three things feel like a chore. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can imagine, right? So what how do you what what are some ideas for someone to break it down? Because like you said earlier, they have this information and it's like Okay, it sounds simple enough, but how how do you how do can they be accountable to make sure they do 
the things that they learn. So if you if you are a couple, you know, being accountable, it's a plan that you set off and you do together. Right. And you will each hold one another accountable. Mm-hmm. So that's often helping. The other thing that you can do is, I mean, we talked about those three things. But in reality, the first thing that we do when we wake up is check our phones. It's the first thing Many that we do. do. So our very... Our very first action in the morning, you have completely thrown that night's sleep off. Mm. Completely. So it's about both of you agreeing or you... And it's a really good practice for our children to see. Yes. We need to model. Children do what children see. That's right. They really do. And if we can charge... You have a charging system outside the bedroom and everyone charges their phone outside the room and it's only everyone knows that you cannot access your phone until i mean ideally 30 minutes from you waking up in the morning mm-hmm. but if that's not possible and we start small 15 minutes after you wake then we can look at the phone but you will then start to get into a habit where you will just naturally do something else because you've started to take that addiction away because that's what it is it's an addiction. you know when we look at the screens it's digital cocaine. Wow. That, that's what it is. That's it is, a whole other topic. We got to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's, you know, the device, like we said with Netflix, it has been designed to keep you completely attached. Yes. Social media. Every time you're scrolling, it's like this doom scrolling. Yes. You're just there it's and you're just like, man, it's I need to get off. But then you yeah. see another thing and another thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's about having that plan. And again, you know, what you can do is that you can put an alarm on your phone. So it's not saying technology is terrible. Right. It's how can we use the technology to support our well-being? Absolutely. Because it, it's everywhere. We can't avoid it. So let's no. work with it rather than avoid it. Right. And it's a, it's, it can be a helpful tool. You know, there's lots of really wonderful apps out there. But of course, if they're in your bedroom, then they're not wonderful apps and because they have to be out of your bedroom. Absolutely. Um, so it will be that you uh, set your alarm one hour before bedtime, mm-hmm. that you come off all forms of screening. There was some fantastic research from Harvard University and they had two groups they had those who read before bed Mm -hmm. on a book and those who used a kindle now we know that the kindle is designed you know to be not have the blue light and it's the evidence was so compelling that the kindle suppressed the melatonin and and it suppressed it it delayed the onset of the melatonin and those who read the kindle found it 30 um it took them 30 minutes longer to fall asleep than those who didn't just reading a book just a book. reading the kindle now if you that's only one aspect yeah and if you've got you know we were on the laptops and screens before we went to bed or before we went into our bed and then we did the reading um if we've got anxiety around work and we've got big problems at work and You know, we are layering. Absolutely. We are layering. And again, if we think about the screen use, very rarely are we just looking at one screen. You will be looking at the TV. We have an iPad. We have the laptop going because of work. And we have... We're not just using one device. Yeah, we're we're digitally distracted across the board. We absolutely are. In the U.S. in particular, um, melatonin is very easy to get. You can get it over the counter right at Walmart or Target even. And... um, I remember when it was first coming out, and especially when I was when I was uh, very chronically stressed, I needed to take melatonin because I just couldn't come down off of the day. And I've known people to take it so continuously that they've just now they, it has no impact on them. So I'd, I'd love if you if you can to kind of talk about the overuse yeah. of external melatonin and how that's impacting the sleep cycle. So first of all, um, saying it doesn't have any impact on them unknown to them it has a huge impact on them Mm -hmm. when they are taking it um long term we know that melatonin is an endocrine disruptor it is a hormone and there's some recent studies that are showing us that it can have an impact on delaying or increasing the onset of puberty because it is an endocrine disruptor we know last year for example that the highest incidence of children um, being admitted to ER or A&E was, an, was overdosing on melatonin gummies. No way. The highest incidence in children 
Um, so we know that melatonin. Okay, so those are those things, that little bit about melatonin. Right. The other thing about melatonin is that you may be buying what would say five milligrams or three milligrams um, and it says that on the packet so you may be purchasing something that says five milligrams five milligrams of melatonin however we know that melatonin has a short shelf life mm -hmm. so the um the melatonin that says five milligrams the research has shown that it can have as much as 88 percent more actually in that packet than it does of what it's saying on the box. How is it legal? <laughs> it's legal because at some point, you know, at any point, the FDA can come in, take it off the shelf and measure. Right. So they want to know that it does contain what it says. But because melatonin has a shelf life and it goes down and down the longer it stays there, the um, the production team are concerned that it, it would not have the right amount. Oh, it'll lose its potency over time. Yeah, yeah. So they increase it and then... Wow. So you are not actually certain and that you are having the, the dose that it's saying. Right. Now, one way around this, and if a, if somebody so is suffering from jet lag or um, what I would advise them, that the only melatonin that they would take would be a plant-based melatonin. And they're not easy to find as opposed mm. to, you know, a synthetic melatonin that's made. Right. So melatonin short term for jet lag, for example... Yes, it can be helpful, but any kind of long-term use, because melatonin, like we've said, it is a hormone. The body produces it naturally. Right. And if we take it as a synthetic form, the body starts to reduce its own melatonin mm -hmm. because the body is understanding, oh, I don't need it because we already have this amount, not being able to recognize that it is synthetic. Wow. So that's also now just again to really elaborate on melatonin. So I'm very fortunate and I am part of um, a university group of Arizona where we have lectures all around sleep. And I feel very fortunate with the actual expertise and knowledge that is shared by neuroscientists and, and different experts. So one week I was listening to this, participating in this lecture with a neuroscientist. And he was saying, and he's a, a neuroscientist from Berkeley, California, and he was saying that from 6 p.m., he doesn't have any lighting in terms of arti artificial from 6 p.m. So he doesn't go on his phone, he doesn't go on the screen, he doesn't have any kind of lighting, he only has um, candles. Interesting. Now he, My husband would love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, your husband will be even happier now. Now, he said... I am not some woohoo hippie. Yeah. I am a hard-nosed scientist. I'm a neuroscientist. Right. Now, within my family, there is a greater incidence and a greater risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I'm not getting all the benefits of melatonin for my overall well-being, I'm increasing the risk of me having cancer. Absolutely. Man, this, so, this goes so much deeper. It it's does. so much it, deeper. It does. And so, you know, with that, we know that when we, for, when we have four hours sleep a night, on that one night where we've had four hours sleep, we've actually um, increased our anti-cancer cells. They have dropped, rather, by 70% on that one night when we only receive four hours sleep because our body hasn't been able to do, which is to release those anti-cancerous cells in its full quantity. Wow. That has not been allowed to happen when we've had such a small amount of sleep. Right, right. Speaking of small amount of sleeps, power napping. Yeah. What are your thoughts around that? So power napping can be really, really helpful. And if we look at NASA, for example, mm -hmm. NASA has concluded that our perfect nap is 26 minutes. 26 minutes. So it's as restorative without it impacting our night sleep because our night sleep is the most beneficial to our overall sleep. Right. And we cannot compensate poor quality sleep for that nap. Right. We mustn't think that. Right. Now, if it's something that is you're using on a short-term basis where you know, you might have a really horrendous deadline with work mm -hmm. and you are going to sleep. Having that nap during the day 
Um, just as a short term solution is absolutely fine as long as it's not impacting your sleep. So you wouldn't have a nap too late in the afternoon because that will impact, impact your, your sleep. sleep yeah. So it's a nice little way to find your calm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. So um, before we before we wrap up, I'd, I'd love to know, um, because we've, we've spoken about melatonin, supplements are all the rage, right? Because yes. if you're, you're lacking nutrition, you're lacking the ability to um, effectively go out and do the things you need to do. If you're not sleeping well, you're probably not eating well. There's just so many dynamics. So from a supplementation standpoint, what are some quality supplements that you recommend to help aid that sleep journey? First of all, this is exactly what they should be. They should be supplementing mm-hmm. good sleep health. They should be supplementing um, our overall wellness. So that's the first thing to recognize, and they shouldn't be used long term. Although some things such as tea, Mm -hmm. tea is such a powerful antidote. We know that, you know, that the studies are coming out more and more that are supporting the use, even with our children. Absolutely. You know, I was with a family this morning, and this little girl, this little boy rather, is nine. Mm -hmm. So I was suggesting that we can introduce some chamomile tea because we know that calms the brain down for our children. So, and of course, adults, it's not just our children. So chamomile teas are really helpful. If we look at ashwagandha, Mm -hmm. ashwagandha is wonderful. wonderful, It is as a de-stressor, you know, for really calming the cortisol levels down. The research research is there supporting it. Magnesium. Magnesium is a really wonderful supplement. But again, we've got to look at the magnesium. Yeah. Because with the magnesium, there's different Different types types. and it has different benefits. Mm -hmm. So we know that magnesium glycinate is the one that supports sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's looking, but we know as well that if we look at the evidence, having a combination of magnesium can be helpful. Mm -hmm. How we take magnesium is also a question in that we know if we take magnesium as a bath soak, that is five times better and the body absorbs it five times greater than if we were to take it as a capsule. Mm -hmm. So it's about how we take it. Absolutely. Um, So there's lots of different supplements that we can look at using. Um, 5-HTP, for example, 5-HTP, again, I think is almost better than using melatonin mm-hmm. because it just helps dial the brain down and helps us, um, helps the body regulate to get onto the time zone where we are. So there are supplements to take, but it's when we take them, how we take them, mm-hmm. and why. Why are that question again? Why? Ask the why. Ask the why. Um, and all of the supplements that Julie has recommended will be available on the blog and on the podcast that you see today. So, Julie, where can people find you to connect with you? Because you've shared an insane amount of information that is beyond valuable. And I want people to go out and find you and connect with you. Uh, Thank you so much for this opportunity. And as we could talk forever, (laughs) because it is about sharing knowledge. (laughs) And the best place probably is on my Instagram, which is nurture to sleep. Dot com. So with the number two, Nurture to Sleep. to Sleep. And then we also have a website, which is www.com, Julie at Nurture to Sleep or Nurture to Sleep. Awesome. Awesome. And this episode today was brought to you by our sponsor, Decompression Realm. Thank you again for the teas and the wonderful relaxation tranquility oil. So Julie, thank you so much for being here with me. I know it's not going to be the last time. (laughs) We have a lot, a lot more to explore. Um, And uh, I really appreciate you sharing all the different ways that people can find their calm via sleep. You are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.